Pride and Prejudice is one of the most popular novels in the English language. But how do you turn a classic book into classic television? For this production of Pride and Prejudice, the overall aim was to be as true as possible to the spirit of Jane Austen's original book. Andrew Davis and I went to a screening um, of another Jane Austen. It was about 1986. Um, and we sat together on the back row and watched it. And it was, it was very good, very quirky. Um, but afterwards, I, I remember turning to Andrew and saying what I would really love to do is a version of Pride and Prejudice, which is my favorite book, um, and do it um, in the way that really reflects the book. When I read the book with a view to adapting it, um, the first thing that, that, that came across was what tremendous speed and energy the book had. It really goes like a train. Um, there's something happening on every page, and there's enormous energy, both in the characters and in the action. People talk about nothing much happening in Jane Austen. This book is absolutely full of events, full of people dashing about, full of people falling in love, breaking their hearts, eloping with each other, trying to seduce each other. And um, I, I, I just thought I, I wanted to convey some of this energy in the adaptation. I wanted to, to get that into the very opening scene. So instead of taking a scene with Elizabeth, I decided to take a scene in which Bingley and Darcy get their first sight of Netherfield Hall, which would involve them galloping across countryside and convey that sense of energy right in the opening shot. The fair prospect. Pretty enough, I grant you. Oh, it's nothing to Pemberley, I know. But I must settle somewhere. Have your approval. You'll find the society something savage. Country manners, I think they're charming. Then you better take it. Thank you. I shall. I shall close with the attorney directly. To me, Pride and Prejudice is a very, very popular book, and I wanted to make a piece of popular television. The producer, Sue Birtwistle, oversees the entire production. People are quite often confused about what a producer does. Um, they, they can't understand the difference between a producer and a director. It's a question I get asked quite a lot. But essentially, what I would do as producer is uh, I would commission a project, work on the scripts, find a home for it, uh, and then see it through every stage. This is somewhere between Pemberley and, and Netherfield. Yeah. I think this is, in so many ways, absolutely perfect. It yeah. is too old. It's older than we actually Simon Langton, yeah. the director, and I would I cast it actually, together. Um, yeah. and um, acreage, work with the production designer the on the concept of it, how, how the production is going to look, um, go to look at locations together, uh, and, and do all that stage running up to um, the actual filming of it. Finding the right locations is fundamental to the entire design process. But is design for a period drama more difficult? There isn't intrinsically a lot of difference between doing period and contemporary. You're still working on the same problems. Um, you just have more limited resources with a period drama. You obviously have to do much more research. Um, and you've got more, difficult, more difficulty in spelling out the characters because you have less tools to play with than you would on the contemporary. And you also have to be very careful as to every shot. Yeah. It's just that there's a lot of stuff from there, stuff from here, people rushing. Got to keep these lines sort of clear. We start with reading about the social life. 
if you start from understanding the situation, the political situation in the country at the time, how people live and what their incomes were, then everything else grows from that. That lady, I suppose, is your mother? Yes, she is. Mama, this is Lady Catherine de Bourgh. And that, I suppose, is one of your sisters? Yes, ma'am. She is my youngest girl, but one. My youngest of all is lately married. You have a very small park here. And this must be a most inconvenient sitting room for the evening in summer. Why, the windows are full west. Indeed they are, your ladyship. But we never sit in here after dinner. We have... Miss Bennet, there seemed to be a prettyish kind of little wilderness on one side of your lawn. I should be glad to take a turn in it. If... You would favour me with your company. Jane Austen has, like every writer, she's got her own specific area that she's particularly concerned with. And um, the, what we're trying to do is to recreate her vision. And so we would start from her books and, and the, the importance that she places on certain things. There's no point in deviating from that. It's important to get every piece of furniture exactly right for the filming. Right, well, let's try it. Three of us have to sit in a line. Thank you, Ryan. And this one? Not very much room. Mm. That's a bit snug, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit easy, that one. Right. I had hoped to condole with your poor father and your mother. Our father is still in London, sir, and our mother is not yet well enough to leave her room. Ah. Ah. <clears throat> I think the locations have to be found exactly right, but, but they convey such a lot of information, the, the, the kind of cosy domesticity, the, the, the natural scale of the Bennett household. And then you see Netherfield and realise that there are much richer people in the story. And then, finally, uh, you see the absolute splendours of Pemberley and, and realise that, that Elizabeth has been proposed to by a man who owns most of Derbyshire. Um, and, and, uh, and the park, uh, which is so big that you can't even see the house. I think we've seen woods and groves enough to satisfy even your enthusiasm for them, Lizzie. I confess I had no idea Pemberley was such a great estate. Should we reach the house itself before dark, do you think? Be patient, wait. There. Stop the coach. I think one would be willing to put up with a good deal to be mistress of Pemberley. The mistress of Pemberley will have to put up with a good deal. From what I hear... She's not likely to be anyone we know. How do you like the house, Lizzie? Very well. I don't think I've ever seen a place so happily situated. I like it very well indeed. Pemberley really has to be the most beautiful place. It's not particularly ostentatious. It's showing great taste. It's got to show history. It has to show a, a lineage that goes back. Um, it's supposed to really be the epitome of all that is good about the aristocracy at that time. Rosings is the opposite. Rosings is probably more flamboyant, large, but over the top. Yeah, this is. Uh, this is a character we don't like so much. Hunsford has to be a small, modest parsonage, but with pretensions um, to grandeur and a certain amount of fussiness about it to reflect Mr. Collins. Longbourn, the Bennett's house, is really just a comfortable family house with no particular pretensions to anything. So. We key the characters to that. We try and find the houses that go with it, the gardens that go with it, the carriages, the furniture, the decorations that all add to that, uh, that image. Mm -hmm. 
In terms of the design for somewhere like Meriton, we can choose our level of reality and we can choose the level that is directly relevant to the book and to the piece that, that we're doing. So on this occasion, we'll concentrate more on the jolly aspects, the handsome soldiers and the socializing and the shops. We won't be dwelling on poverty, we won't be dwelling on any of the sort of real solid, hard, edged aspects of rural life because it's not an area that Jane Austen was particularly interested in. We, we see Meryton really through the eyes of her characters. Costumes are also influenced by how each character comes across in the book. Quite safe here, Mr. Darcy, do you think? Damn silly where to spend an evening. Miss Bingley would never have been seen in a, in a print dress. Uh, she would always worn silk or very fine embroidered muslin. Um, we also gave Miss Bingley very, very big feathers, um, although Anna Chancellor is over six foot. Um, uh, in order to emphasise her haughtiness and her high social standing because she just wanted to look as, you know, as, as posh and as snobby as possible. To get a real sense of the characters, I read the book and the script um, to have a, you know, a detailed knowledge of, of how they develop throughout the book um, so that I can start to understand how they would dress. Well, casting, it's a truism to say casting is important. It is probably the most important thing or aspect of the whole production process, uh, particularly uh, for a book that is so well known. Because unlike other novels which have been adapted and successfully done, Pride and Prejudice is, I think I'm right in saying, is one of, if not the most widely read, uh, classical novel in English language. If we've got Alison and Ben, Mr. and Mrs. Bennet, mm. yeah. Um, so if, if you like, there's an even more enhanced uh, responsibility really on the part of sure the, the casting the process to get those people absolutely right. I mean, we're very, very keen to have David uh, Bamber mm. as Mr. Collins. Now, when we first auditioned um, David Bamber for Mr. Collins, um, I, I thought he was the ideal person for this job and uh, he absolutely proved it when he came into audition because he, he performed the um, proposal scene um, and he did it completely seriously which is the only way it works. My reasons for marrying are first that I think it a right thing for every clergyman to set the example of matrimony in his parish. Secondly that I am convinced it will add very greatly to my happiness and thirdly which perhaps I should have mentioned first, that it is the particular recommendation of my noble patroness, Lady Catherine de Bourgh. Mr. Collins, she said, you must marry. Choose properly, she said. Choose a gentlewoman for my sake, and for your own, let her be an active, useful sort of person, not brought up too high. Find such a woman as soon as you can. Bring her to Hunsford, and I will visit her. In approaching the character, um, what, I've, what I'm attempting to do, as opposed to what I'm achieving, is to show a contrast between the pre-proposal Collins when he first arrives in our, in the case of this adaptation, which is episode two, and the post-proposal, which is really when you see him in Rosings Park and at Huntsford Parsonage. Observe that closet, Cousin Elizabeth. What do you say to that? Well... Is it not the very essence of practicality and convenience? Lady Catherine de Bourgh herself was kind enough to suggest that these shelves be fitted exactly as you see them there. Shelves in the closet? Happy thought indeed. I think that in the Rosings scenes, I show more of a servile, rather dark and sardonic and unpleasant character. Yeah. 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 
Alison Steadman is an extraordinary actress, and, and I've always thought that, and we thought that. Um, I've admired her intensely for, for all the various films she's done, and, and this is admittedly a slight risk, as uh, she's probably said herself, is a completely new uh, avenue for her talents. Um, uh, when we did go to the read-through, and start the read-through, it was always a very nerve-wracking day. You get, I think there was something like 100 people there. Um, and she has, she almost starts the dialogue off. Uh, she, she attacked it like a bolting chariot. It was most extraordinary. Confined, unvarying. I would have him know we dine with four and 20 families. As an actress, I am constantly on the lookout for fun roles, things that are going to be interesting and give me plenty of scope to be creative. Mama, have you seen Charlotte Bucket since I came away? Yes, she called yesterday with Sir William. What an agreeable man he is. That is my idea of good breeding. And those who fancy themselves very important and never open their mouths quite mistake the matter. When I was offered this part, um, I hadn't read the book. So I first of all read the book and then um, read the scripts. And of course, as soon as I read it, I could hear the voice of Mrs. Bennett. She just comes off the page. So beautifully written. The character is all there. It's all there. It's like a box of chocolates, you know, you do, just ready to dive into. And, and I just couldn't, couldn't resist. Oh, Mr. Bennett, you are wanted immediately. We are all in uproar. You must come and make Lizzie marry Mr. Collins, for she vows she will not have him. And if you do not make haste, Mr. Collins will change his mind and he will not have her. I've not the pleasure of understanding you. Uh, of uh, what are you talking? Oh, Mr. Collins and Lizzie. Lizzie declares she will not have Mr. Collins and Mr. Collins begins to say he will not have Lizzie. Well, what am I to do on the occasion? Seems a hopeless business. <sighs> Speak to Lizzie about it yourself. Tell her you insist upon her marrying him. Let her come in. Lizzie! I particularly wanted Colin Firth to, to play Darcy. Um, and some people thought it was an odd, an odd choice. And I think Colin himself thought it was an odd choice. And um, he, in fact, said no at the beginning. And I absolutely had to insist that he think again and do it. Uh, for him to, to take the part, and he said he came to a stage where he realised that if anybody else played the part, he'd be immensely jealous, because the part had taken over him. Um, he's an amazing actor. Uh, physically, himself, he doesn't actually look like Darcy, but I think you'd agree, or I hope most people would agree, that he actually looks incredibly like Darcy when he's playing Darcy. This scene gives the impression that Colin Firth, as Darcy, gets soaked in the lake at Pemberley. In actual fact, this isn't quite true. The scene is put together using lots of different shots, which sometimes require several takes from different angles. So the film crew doesn't want Colin to get wet too quickly. He does dive, but not into the lake. It's onto this blue mattress. Meanwhile, his stunt double is about to jump in the lake. All under the watchful eye of these professional divers, here to take care of everyone's safety. Colin did get to swim underwater, but this sequence was filmed on a different day using a special water tank. Even if they don't always do their own stunts, actors in period dramas like Pride and Prejudice may be required to demonstrate other talents, like dancing. Dances were immensely important at this time. 
Um, it, they gave an opportunity for young men and women to meet um, and to court, if you like. Um, so they were always eagerly awaited. I started by rereading the book and marking all the points where dance is mentioned and dances are mentioned and dancers are mentioned. And also I marked all the places where they bow and they curtsy and they reverence and they come and they go and they show their sort of social manners, how they behaved at that point in time. These English country dances that you see in Pride and Prejudice were danced in the country houses and in the court. And Mr. Beveridge's Maggot is a supreme example of that. And it has this harmony which almost reflects the architecture of the time, the furniture of the time, the landscape gardening of the time. There is a reflection in their relationship. I remember hearing you once say that you hardly ever forgave, that your resentment once created was implacable. You are very careful, are you not, in allowing your resentment to be created? I am. There's almost an intellectual fight between them. At the same time as that's going on, there's something totally harmonious happening between them physically. And never allow yourself to be blinded by prejudice? I hope not. May I ask to what these questions tend? Merely to the illustration of your character, I'm trying to make it out. And what is your success? I do not get on at all. I hear such different accounts of you as to puzzle me exceedingly. You should feel when you look at the dance that these are two people who are going to, at some point, really get on extremely well. Editing is the third aspect of the whole production process. You have pre-production, you have the actual production itself, and then you have post-production, uh, which is almost entirely editing. It's the editing process and how we put it together. You can change the whole focus of a scene uh, simply by staying on one shot one second longer than another. The beauty of the love between Darcy and, and Elizabeth, that it is held back almost to the last moment. And, and it's the timing of the shots between the two of them. Uh, too long in either way would have... Uh, made it self-conscious, but it's not. It is just the right time. I think, as far as music concerned, actually what you do, in a sense, is provide a fourth dimension, something which is not said or seen in terms of the visual action, but something more abstract, which is thought and, and hinted at. Now, you can ruin it by making it too strong, too obvious. Uh, but you can help it by just, in some mysterious way, keep it going in, in a romantic sense. Please allow me to thank you on behalf of all my family, since they don't know to whom they are indebted. If you will thank me, let it be for yourself alone. Your family owes me nothing. As much as I respect them, I believe I thought only of you. You are too generous to trifle with me. If your feelings are what they were last April, tell me so at once. My affections and wishes are unchanged. But one word from you will silence me on this subject forever. Oh, my feelings. My feelings are... I'm ashamed to remember what I said then. My feelings are so different. In fact, they are quite the opposite. Oh, it's a lovely book. Um, it's a classic love story. Even the fellows on the unit who don't really normally like much period drama, they, uh, they've all read it and they think it's wonderful. They couldn't put it down. So I've had a few of the prop men saying, oh, it's great. <laughs> we all hope that we've done justice to this fantastic book of Jane Austen's, this fantastic story. I mean, we've all gone to a lot of trouble, not only from the acting department, but every department. Um, the design of the costumes and the 
the wigs if necessary and the makeup. We're not allowed to wear any makeup and mascara and things, which is quite a shock to some of us, not to be able to put a flick of mascara on. But we've tried to stick absolutely and make it as real and authentic as possible. I've read it now hundreds of times, but every single time I wait to see if Elizabeth and Darcy are going to get together. Um, I still suspend my disbelief until, until that moment, and I long for them for it to work out. So it is the best romance. <laughs> <laughs>